watching QTV and I am Jenna Bosonko. So today we have a special interview in commemoration of International Women's Day powered by UNFPA. And I'm joined by Miss Aisha Sise, journalist and author. If you've been following developments, you would realize that she has been appointed UNFPA Goodwill Ambassador. Welcome, Aisha. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you and happy International Women's Day. Wish you the same. Thank so you. excited Thank to be you. sharing this platform with you. So Aisha, being a black woman and an African from a patriarchal society, how does it feel being appointed UNFPA Goodwill Ambassador? Well, thank you for having me. I, I, I think that it's a wonderful opportunity to um, speak out about issues that aren't theoretical to me, but are issues that I know I know well um, from personal experience from growing up in Sierra Leone, not too far from the Gambia. We, we suffer from many of, of the same issues of appallingly high rates of gender-based violence, um, harmful practices uh, to, to women and girls, and, and, and teenage pregnancy rates, which are just unacceptable. Uh, but it, it helps uh, to, to come at it as an insider, as opposed to an outsider, as an African, as a woman, as somebody who grew up in Sierra Leone and spent her formative years there. I, I think all of this helps uh, helps deliver the message of change that is necessary. And so I'm incredibly proud to have been appointed a UNFPA Goodwill Ambassador and to speak from my, my own personal experience and connection to these issues. Uh, so moving on, currently we are facing a pandemic, a coronavirus pandemic, but in Gambia here, when I have conversations with a lot of women activists, we call the current situation a gender-based violence pandemic as well. Because due to the coronavirus pandemic restrictions, lockdown measures and other measures, women are living in the same homes with their abusers. The rate of sexual and gender-based violence has risen significantly. What's your take on that? Yes, and, and this is something that we, we, we can't talk about enough and we have to have as a central part of all conversations around this pandemic, that there's a shadow pandemic, if you will, alongside the health crisis. And, and that's one that's taking place in homes and communities where we're seeing it incredible spikes of, of cases of gender-based violence. Uh, as you just laid out, a lot of women and girls trapped in the same spaces as their abusers. Um, we're seeing that uh, for, for every three months, we're seeing millions of increases of reports of violence. And, and this is just, it's terrifying, quite frankly, and we need to see this reality at the center of, of government responses to COVID in terms of policies, in terms of services, that needs to be implemented and part of the conversation. Yeah, so Aisha, what, why do you think it is important for uh, political will in respective countries? Because if you look at Sierra Leone, for instance, uh, Madabio, President Madabio, at some point declared a national rape emergency in Sierra Leone. So why the need for political will in terms of gender, gender and sexual based violence? Yeah, listen, I think that what you need when it comes to political intervention, first of all, is we want first of all more women at the table, more female participation. That's absolutely critical. I mean, Sierra Leone and Gambia don't have enough women taking part in political life decision making. We see women really consigned to the sidelines all too often where they're cheering and they're supporting and they're organizing, but they're not actually standing, setting agendas and platforms, women and, 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 and young people um, at the table, because then the, the, the priorities and the concerns of women and girls will be central to all decision making. And we need legislation. You ask why it's important. It's not just a case of having, um, it's not just about having civil society and, and having you know groups like UNFPA in the mix. We need to have the government as a support, as a partner in this, laying down the legislation, creating the policies, which they act upon to make this um, uh, uh, make this change permanent, if you will, and, and and that's absolutely critical. We can't have it piecemeal. We want it to be coordinated, it to be well thought out, and we also want the financing, the resourcing, to be placed behind some of this policy that we need to put in place to see that FGM is is brought to an end, to see that you know child marriage is brought to an end, to see that the um, perpetrators of rape and gender based violence are arrested and prosecuted we need laws we need laws and we need resources 
Yeah, Aisha, I think Rwanda is a perfect example because if you look at their parliament, there are more women than men in their parliament. Right. And if you look at the Gambia here, we have only five female National Assembly members and two of them are nominated. It's only three of them that have been elected into office. Quite sad. It is very sad. I, I speak um, about this issue with personal connection. My mother was a politician in Sierra Leone before she took ill a, a couple of years ago. And he was a politician who was in the cabinet and, and was a minister in, in, in Sierra Leone and, you know, spoke to me often about the necessity of having women at the table and how in the absence of women being at the table, our needs, our concerns are, are just prioritized, you know, and you could go so far as to start. So it's absolutely important that you have women there, that you have women putting our perspective at the center. We're referring issues. I mean, a country like the Ghana has more women than it has men, right? And yeah. we want to see females' potential realized. And, and, and what we have seen is that when women are at the table, when decisions are being made, they're more inclusive decisions. They don't just benefit women, as you well know, but they benefit everybody. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Considering the fact that women are mothers and they have both male and female children, they tend to cater for everyone. So I think uh, what you're trying to put across is quite uh, important. Uh, we are aware of the fact that your mom is an FGM survivor and your grandma was a cutter. So how does it feel fighting for something that your mom was a victim of and having your grandma as a cutter? Yeah, my, my my one of my grandfather's wives was a cutter. I, you know, my my family is is like many from the continent. You know, my grandparents had multiple. My grandfather's wife had multiple wives. So you know, I, I come from a polygamous background. Really, is 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 what's in my in my family lineage. And one of his wives, um, my step grandmother, I guess, um, was 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 a cutter. Um, uh, and my mother was even though she was herself a survivor of, of FGM, she was firmly against it and um, really became an, an active um, a voice against the practice continuing. And so, you know, that wasn't my path in, in life. That It wasn't the, uh, if you will, or a harmful practice that I suffered, but only because my mother was someone who felt that and believed and knew it to be wrong, wrong and harmful. Necessary, unjustified, just rooted in culture. Things don't change. Culture changes all the time. You know, parts of the world used to bind their their children's feet. You know, and they don't do that anymore. We can change many other ways, and this is one way that we have to change again. Yeah, so Aisha, let's talk a little bit about laws because in the Gambia here, since 2016, FGM and child marriage have been banned. But, I mean, the laws are just there, but the implementation is lacking a lot. It's, it's like really the laws are not there at all. So what, what's your take on that? The laws are there, they're not being implemented. People are not being convicted for this. So I'm wondering the essence. Listen, I, I'm not going to say laws don't matter. Laws do matter. The laws do matter in terms of code of and putting them on the books and having them there as a bedrock. That's absolutely important. But on top of the laws, and as you rightly say, having laws, great. If, you're not, if they're not implemented, as you again make the point, they might as well not exist. I think when it comes to FGM and harmful practices, it's going to come down to behavior change and changing people's understanding of this issue and, and why it is so harmful. And that means speaking to um, traditional leaders, to religious leaders, to cultural leaders and speaking respectfully um, and, and helping uh, helping uh, uh, each party hear the other side and have this meaningful exchange. Um, I, I think that, you know, that I, I think about a lot is that when Ebola struck in, in, in 20, uh, 2014, um, 2016, one of the, the rights that one of the, the burial rights we have as, as, as Muslims is that you have to bathe the body, right? And one of the things that they said during Ebola is that you couldn't bathe the body because that exposed you to the virus. And I remember speaking to an epidemiologist and an anthropologist who said, you can't just take something from a group of people. You can't just take a right or away from a right RIT te away from a group you have to give them something in, in you have to replace it with something 
And so if it's a case that, and, and I'm just speaking extemporaneously here, if it's the case that FGM is really just about a rite of passage as opposed to an attempt to subjugate women and, and minimize women, then if we need to find something else that is a is a is a non harmful rite of passage for women and girls to go through, then we can think about that culturally, anthropologically, what that could be. But it cannot involve cannot involve rather cutting um, girls' genitalia off. It serves no purpose. It leads to, to to lifelong problems in many cases, and it is just harmful. And so I, I get it. When you say, what do we do? We have to have conversations. We have to have conversations and find this way where cultural leaders, religious leaders feel their voices are heard. And, and maybe there is a different practice. I, I don't know what that is, but it doesn't involve cutting people and potentially killing people. I think we can find a way around this to do something symbolically that makes people feel as if they weren't stripped of something that means so much to their culture without being given something else to replace it, if you see where I'm going. It's a conversation yeah. that we need to have. Yeah, conversations matter. I totally agree with that. Now, Aisha, at a personal level, how were you able to really sh smash patriarchy at the, your personal level to be able to reach where you are? Because we all come from patriarchal societies and we all know what we are told usually in relation to where we want to get. Me personally, sometimes I'm told, why do you want to be a journalist? Go do something else where your face is not going to show, where you would be at the background because you are a woman. How were you able to deal with that really? Yeah, I, I don't know about smashing patriarchy. I mean, I feel that, um, you know, it's, um, it's I, I just want I, I want us all as men and women to be able to fulfill our potential for us to be able to, to live together with respect and um, supporting each other in our in our personal dreams and ambitions. I, I, I don't see it about, uh, you know, I'm not looking for an inversion where, you know, men have no voice either. Um, I, I'm just looking for equality. I'm looking for equity, equity of access, equity of opportunity. And I'm, I'm, asking, for, I'm asking for protection for women and girls. For me personally, um, um, you know, I, again, I, I grew up in a home because my father passed away when I was young. So I grew up in a home with a mother, a matriarch, you know, and who was incredibly strong and very much painted a, a, a very clear vision of what my world could look like. And that was one and is one without any limitations, with one where my voice matters just as much as any male, one where my dreams and ambitions, ambitions are valid and are within reach. And I, and I think it starts with that. It starts with those closest around, or those closest to you and what they speak into you. Um, and that's important because sometimes you may not see it around you. Um, and so those words matter. They matter in terms of helping like sow the seed. And then I always say, you know, your own personal conversation, your own self-talk matters. What you tell yourself that internal dialogue also matters, that self-belief, um, which, you know, thankfully, because of technology now, even if you don't see it in your immediate environment, with technology and social and just having access to the internet, you can see how different the world is and how there are so many women, so many black women, African women doing amazing things, and you could be one of them. Thank you so much, Aisha. Due to time constraints, we are going to uh, stop here, but I wish we had more time to continue this conversation, very fruitful conversation there. Gambian women are watching you. What message do you want to leave with them? I think Gambian women are, first of all, I, all African women, we're all, we're all sisters, but, and, and you know, we're from the same neighborhood. Um, yep. I'm not far away from you as a Sarah Nihunian. So I, I think it's really for us to, uh, as sisters, as African women across the continent, really, and especially with this International Women's Day uh, theme of women in leadership, it is to seek out those opportunities where our voices can be heard. It is to believe in our own voices. And it is to see that there are no spaces that we do not deserve to be in. And to really believe in our own our own potential um, yep. and our own power and to stand to stand together as one That's yeah thank message. you so much Aisha that is all we have thank you so much and we wish you good luck in your future endeavors being the UNFPA goodwill ambassador Thank Viewers, that is all we have for you in this special edition with Miss Isa Shise, author and journalist on International Women's Day, powered by UNFPA. Thanks for joining us and bye for now. <laughs>